Welcome to Radiologist Headquarters. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and I'm going to give you five cases in about five minutes. Ultrasound number three. For each unknown case, I'll show each slide for about 10 seconds. At that point, you can pause and examine the images further if you'd like. Then I'll review the findings, reveal the diagnosis, and move on to the next case. We only have five minutes, so let's go. Case one, slide one of three. This is a cine clip of the bladder. Slide two of three showing some static images. That left hand image is with the patient rolled. Slide three of three color and power Doppler images. Okay, so we're looking at a transverse cine clip of the bladder, and there's a large mass that seems to be growing out of the left wall. It's a polypoid mass with a frond like margin. And also notice that there's a faint right ureteral jet. You see that better usually with color Doppler imaging. And then posterior to the mass, there's a bit of clot. These static images again show the transverse appearance of the mass as well as the correlative sagittal appearance coming off of the wall. And then this is a rolled image showing that the mass does not move. And that's one of the great things about ultrasound. It's such a dynamic modality. Whenever you see a bladder mass, you should have the patient roll. And if it changes position, it's a clot or it could be a pedunculated neoplasm, but this is staying fixed to the wall, typical for a neoplasm. Color and power Doppler imaging are super helpful when evaluating a bladder mass because an isolated blood clot will not have vascular flow, but a neoplasm typically will, as in this case, you can see extensive intratumoral flow on both color and power Doppler imaging. And this was resected and found to be papillary urothelial carcinoma, the most common bladder cancer, also known as transitional cell carcinoma. So it will typically have this polypoid appearance with frond-like margins and vascular flow. All right, next case, slide one of two, pancreas. Slide two of two. Okay, on this left-hand image, you can see that the pancreatic duct is dilated. I don't have calipers on it, but it measures over four millimeters. And that's leading to this lobulated pancreatic head mass that's heterogeneously hypoechoic, solid in appearance. This transverse image just shows the calipers around the mass. And the sagittal image shows how large it is, measuring up to 5.4 centimeters. And also, again, heterogeneously hypoechoic. You can see the pancreatic duct leading right to it. This image is showing marked dilatation of the common bile duct leading up to this mass right up to the mass, and you can see that the duct is dilated to 1.6 centimeters. There's also some partially imaged intrapatic biliary ductal dilatation, and that's confirmed with the addition of color Doppler here because the bile ducts should never have color flow within them. And that's good to add because this, even though this looks like the common bile duct, sometimes varices can mimic biliary ducts. Or also patients with hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, osler weber rendu syndrome, will often have dilated uh, hepatic vasculature that can mimic biliary ductal dilatation, and you can differentiate that with the addition of color Doppler. And so this was pancreatic head adenocarcinoma causing a double duct sign with dilatation of both the common bile duct and pancreatic ducts. Sometime before the ultrasound, the patient also had a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis, again showing that pancreatic head mass, it looks infiltrative and hypodense, and there's the portal vein leading up to the mass, and also notice again the pancreatic duct dilated right up to the level of the mass. There's the mass a bit more inferiorly. And this occurred before the common bile duct and intrapatic biliary ductal dilatation developed, but you can see that it was inevitable since the common bile duct is headed right here into the mass. All right, next case, slide one of two. This is the retroperitoneum. Slide two of two, CT scan. All right, these images are a bit difficult to interpret since we don't have anatomic landmarks, but we are in the retroperitoneum. This is in the psoas muscle, and we see this heterogeneous collection that has both anechoic and heterogeneously echogenic areas corresponding to solid and liquefactive areas of a hematoma within the psoas muscle. And you can see that the psoas muscle is expanded here. We actually have a fluid hematocrit level, and it's displacing the right kidney. So this was a retroperitoneal hematoma within the right psoas muscle. Also notice that the normal fat density you see interdigitating between the muscle fibers is effaced in the setting of a retroperitoneal psoas muscle hematoma. 
Incidentally, we have some bonus CT anatomy. Here's the anterior renal fascia and the posterior renal fascia, nicely demarcated by fluid, also known as Gerota's fascia and Zucker Candle's fascia. And you can see that the lateral coronal fascia extends right into that area. All right, case four, quick anatomy question. What are the arrows pointing to? Okay, so what are we looking at here? Well, this is a transverse view of the pancreas. There's the splenic vein, and you have these two rounded anechoic foci in the region of the pancreatic head. If I added color Doppler, a clue is that this one would have flow and this would not. And so anteriorly, that's the gastroduodenal artery and posteriorly, the common bile duct. So this is a great place to pick up these structures on the transverse view because it's another look at the common bile duct distally where you might have a little stone. And then also the gastroduodenal artery, rarely in patients with chronic pancreatitis, can evolve into a pseudoaneurysm. So that's another area to be aware of. Also, this may or may not help you, but I think it kind of looks like two eyes of a snake, doesn't it? Or maybe I've just been staring at the pancreas for too long. All right, last case, slide one of one, uterus. Okay, on this left upper image, you can see that there's an ovoid echogenic mass-like focus that seems to be expanding the fundal endometrium. Here's a more normal appearing portion of the endometrium at the uterine body with a trilaminar, somewhat late follicular phase appearance. So the best modality to evaluate the endometrium is with sonohistrography where saline is instilled into the endometrial cavity distending it. And you can see that saline is causing the sound waves to speed up, causing increased through transmission posteriorly. And then the fluid is nicely outlining this homogeneous echogenic polypoid mass, which is clearly arising from the anterior endometrium. When we add color Doppler imaging, you can see a vascular stock leading to this lesion with diffuse vascular flow. And this is typical for an endometrial polyp. Now, a submucosal fibroid can sometimes appear similar to an endometrial polyp, but it will tend to have less vascularity and will also have posterior acoustic shadowing. Okay, that is it for five cases in five minutes, or five-ish minutes, ultrasound number three. As always, you can subscribe to Radiologist Headquarters on both Apple Podcasts and YouTube, where reviews and comments are appreciated. Visit us at radiologisthq.com for additional info and to follow us on social media. Thanks and have a great day.